Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Welcome. My name is Mark Caron, and we're here on Spirit Plant Medicine Presents, a new series of video podcasts and conversations with leaders from around the world who have great experience and information to share in regards to plant medicines, whether psychedelic or psychoactive, and how they can help make an impact to transform humanity and the world. And today I am joined by my partner, friend, and uh, he, he's an author, speaker, host of the Spear Plant Medicine Conference and ceremony leader and educator, Mr. Stephen Gray, as well as the beautiful and awesome Dank Duchess, who is a cannabis and hashish uh, expert, connoisseur, and all things you want to know about the world of cannabis and hashish. And of course, author, uh, speaker, good friend Tom Hatzis and Eden Woodruff coming from Portland, Oregon today. And today we're going to talk about cannabis medicine and how it can help us transform the world. So welcome everyone to the program. It's great to see everyone today. Good morning, Mark. Thanks, Mark. Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. Hi. Awesome. Well, here we are. I know we've got... Uh, you know, we have Spirit Plant Medicine Conference coming up, which is what Stephen and I are known for. And Tom has his, again, what I love, the pay what you can't for instance, the second Eden's second, idea. Eden, she, well, brilliant, she coined, Eden. Brilliant. Yes. I, I love it. I, I use it a lot. And I've really adopted uh, the phrase non-accessible is not acceptable. And, you know, we can talk about that a little bit today, um, you know, because we see within, you know, psychedelic medicine world, sometimes pricing gets to the point where it's not accessible for the many. And these are medicines that grow naturally on this planet. And, you know, given the chance, how Dennis McKenna and I always say, who gives man the, the right to make a plant illegal anyway? So, you know, let's dive in. And really, uh, Duchess, it, it's been a while. I remember, you know, one of the last times we worked together was our 2020 virtual conference when the power went out as we were going live oh, and we were doing that. the big reveal of, of making hash. Um, maybe oh, you can let us know what's new in your world, uh, where you are. You just got back from Germany. Um, what's What's happening? What's going on with you? Well, um, since then, since we last talked, I really decided that I wanted to do the Indiana Jones thing with cannabis. I'm trying to touch resin around the world, uh, teach about it, talk about psychedelics. So since then, I've been to a couple of different countries dealing with cannabis, and I just did come back from Germany, going to Mexico next week. And then going to see Tom in Oregon, and then I'm going to South Africa. And all of this is just to be able to continue enrich myself uh, with regards to cultivation, cultivation techniques, and of course, hashish. Um, you know, I say my niche is hashish because everything that you can need to know about cannabis can be found in those perfect trichomes. So I'm always on the hunt for the best ones. <laughs> Me too, but for know. totally different reasons. <laughs> <laughs> So education is the main thing, you know, um, always uh, I'm involved with a couple of projects with uh, cultivation at home. I was uh, testing a couple of lights and now I'm testing a system that allows you to grow cannabis horizontally rather than vertically to be able to take advantage of the full uh, length of the plant to, to be able to bud it. And I'm excited about that. And I'm working on an app. So cultivation, hashish and travel. That's what I'm doing. That's a good life. Yes, beautiful. And 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 Tom, how about you? What uh, what's going on? I know you guys have the thrift shop coming uh, opening anytime now, and uh, the conference coming in just a few weeks. Yeah, uh, and you want to tell a little about the yeah. shop? So we've had a few soft openings type events. Um, the shop is pretty well set up uh, to open, but we're deciding to put all our energy first into um, this conference. We have coming up in just a few weeks, and then we're excited to have our grand opening um, early next month. Yeah, we were trying to do both at the same time. And just a word of advice, if you're ever planning on opening a thrift store and putting on a conference at the same time, learn oh. from us, do one at a time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Should that be your summer plans, just take our, you know, yeah, yeah, <laughs> take our advice on that one, if you like. Yeah, 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 yeah. indeed. <laughs> Awesome. And Stephen, how about you? I know you're always on the hunt for 
you know, learning new things in regards to this field. And you're going to be speaking at Tom's conference in a few weeks with with the Duchess. Um, what is it about cannabis specifically that you're, you, you have found? Because you, as the author of Cannabis and Spirituality, there's so many people out there in the world today that never think of that connection. Maybe you can share a few nuggets of, of what you've learned over the years and how cannabis and spirituality are related and how it's such a powerful sacrament. Wow. How long do I have? <laughs> that's a, that's a <laughs> great question. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a great question. It, but well, uh, you, you got to have the elevator pitch, you know, three sentences, man. <laughs> no, okay. Just kidding. I'll, I'll give you the bullet points. First of all, um, th this plant is uh, perhaps 90 million years old. It, certainly the lineage of the Cannabaceae lineage is that old. So it's been with us always and will always be with us. It's our plant. It's the people's plant. Some people call it the people's psychedelic. Um, it's been used spiritually, if you want to call it, use that term, since time immemorial. Uh, we don't even know Tom. Tom, as you know, as a historian, knows probably at least as much, if not more, about that than I do. But it's been around for a long time and used that way in many, many circumstances. And you know, so perhaps the question is, you know, given the context that you just put on it, Mark, that people in general don't seem to know much about that, or a lot of people don't. Um, so why or how does that work? And that's why it's a little difficult to get it down to a short answer. But um, you know, let me put it this way. Uh, two of the contributors to cannabis and spirituality have referred to it as the sacrament of peace um, for the and 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 added on for the universal religion of the future. <laughs> um, you know, you want if you want one sacrament that's that is for the most part safe, but potentially very powerful. Um, cannabis could be the one, you know, um, but then it comes down to how you use it. Uh, if you know, it can be. Uh, I, I think of cannabis as a as an extremely gracious plant um, or spirit. You might even say, uh, in that um, she, and I'll call her she, um, uh, will allow you to use her any way that you want to, so to speak. But not all those uses are going to benefit you or the people around you, for that matter, because you can use her to bliss out, you know, put put a la la effect on your life, uh, hide out in your man cave, so to speak, <clears throat> um, uh, take the edge off of emotions that you probably should be dealing with, um, escape responsibilities and all that kind of stuff. Um, and so if you use it in the, in a sense, opposite direction, if you use it with the intention to um, learn to um, receive insights that benefit you and other people, to um, open your mind, open your heart, um, calm yourself down and pay attention. It has remarkable potential that way. I think of it as a, as an advanced spiritual medicine in the sense that as, an, as a, what you might call neutral or nonspecific amplifier, cannabis um, uh, raises the stakes. So, um, you know, how many people do you know um, that can sit in silent, follow the breath meditation for half an hour and not have a thought other than Eckhart Tolle, who claims he can. <laughs> That's the power of now guy. Um, anyway, okay, yeah. yeah um, anyway, yeah, he said he can sit for two hours with nary a thought. Um, but most of us cannot do that, uh, you know, just doing it in, you know, quote, sober. Um, so given that cannabis um, uh, energizes the system uh, and in a sense invites us to let go more deeply, that can be more of a challenge. Um, and, and the energy that it gives us oftentimes makes us want to escape that, uh, you know, and, you know, fill the space with things. But if you can pay attention, if you can, as Terence McKenna once said about the psychedelic, sit down, shut up and pay attention. That's not the only way to use cannabis, obviously. There are many benefits of this plant, but the, the, the sort of the open secret, as it were, is that um, if we can allow some space in our minds, then she can help us deepen into our, um, into our what you might call our true selves. So I'll leave it there. <clears throat> and, and Duchess, what would you add based on your experience and what you've seen around the world? um from you know cannabis and and the difference I, i'm curious about the difference between cannabis and hashish um because it's made you know we, we get hashish from from cannabis but now what's the difference in the you know say the pros and cons between the two in your experience uh, i wouldn't say there are very many many cons other than like you know across the board you know, if you're consuming cannabis, 
without it being conscientious and you just trying to take the edge off you know I talked about that the the last conference about how I was definitely consuming cannabis and has she in massive quantities just because I was feeling badly so you can do that with either thing I think one of the things that's different um one of the things that's different comes down to who smokes what and why and uh I don't want to be tattling on my own on my own industry but I have found that the popularity, the sheer popularity of hashish and hashish products, and when I say that, I'm meaning advanced products like rosin, rosin jam, piatella, all these other things that we can do that are further processes, they have become, in a way, an exclusionary type of gatekeeping situation where only the people who know of the most phenomenal stuff get to have it and then use social media to taunt everybody else for not having it. I mean, that's particularly nuanced, but that's literally what's at. So right now you got these, like, I'll be real honest, yesterday, a $1,000 hash jar was like debuted, $1,000. And so that really just goes to show now how we're getting away from the idea of cannabis bringing us together to now being like, well, you can't smoke like us because we are smoking this fantastic stuff. Is that happening for everybody? No, but for a lot of the newer people coming in, especially the younger people in the United States, that is a thought process. And in a way it kind of pollutes um, the other market. So I just came back from Berlin and you'll see the younger people using the same type of mannerisms and the same kind of uh, way of speaking that's not necessarily always holding cannabis up to its highest high but rather looking at it as just a commodity for ego trade wow I know that's, beautiful that's yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. So well I just, <laughs> yeah I can just weigh in on that for a second um uh, you've addressed something a number of things that are really important there I think and one of them is um, I, th uh, I I would suspect and maybe Tom and Eden would like to weigh on on this one um, but uh, it's the it's the sort of diametrical difference between a consumerist attitude and a relational attitude with these medicines and plants right you know yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I actually, I don't have much to add to that because I agree <laughs> with exactly how it was phrased. I, I was listening to Alexander Biner last night. He was talking about psychedelic capitalism. Um, he's one of the um, hosts of uh, organizers of Breaking Convention, and he just came out with that book, How Psychedelics Can Help Make Sense of the World. And uh, one of the things he submits is how we need to treat these things as sacred um and they're not just um another like they're and and um and bob jesse has um said that you know these things are exceptional and we need to treat them not like any other you know um medicine like a prozac but they um they deserve reverence they deserve to be treated um or or the, the relationship will sour um mm -hmm. over time and it's so important to maintain um, this this co uh, this co creation and this relationship we are creating with them. Well, uh, you know, one I, thing I hesitate like to, to uh, I hesitate to uh, promote other people's books other than my own. However, <laughs> um, uh, this book that you just mentioned uh, was recommended to me by my friend and the owner of the legendary bookstore uh, Banyan Books as a, as a as something worth getting. I haven't started it yet, but there you go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's awesome. <clears throat> well, it's, it's funny that, you know, the conversation goes this way, because I remember when I first got introduced to plant medicine, you know, I thought it was a pretty worldly guy. I like to, you know, I smoke pot all the time. It was like part of my daily activity for most of my adult life. And when I got introduced to I, I thought, OK, they talked about addiction and all of these things. It was like uh, it's time for me to quit smoking marijuana. That was one of the things I was going for. And what Aya showed me was not about quitting. It was okay. about honoring the plant, the, the reverence. And, you know, it's about moderation and respect that totally changed my perspective. And I'd never heard of a cannabis ceremony. Like, what's that? And then I get involved in, in that with some people in the community as I started getting into the conference work I was doing. 
and it completely changed. And it's what you're saying is the relationship with uh, the plant. And, and that was the big thing for me that now it's, it's very much an honoring and an appreciation versus just a, a bad vice because I'm smoking just to get high and it's, you know, a habit. And Stephen changed my life many times uh, in, in a number of ceremonies. And I'll never forget this one time we were in ceremony. And I'm thinking what I'm thinking as we're sharing in the closing circle, another woman had just shared. It's like, Stephen, was that really just cannabis? Because on like three mm -hmm. tokes, we had had these really powerfully profound psychedelic experiences from you know i always say and that's stevens and my joke is how for me how little can actually take one person so far and it was just a really incredible thing that i always share with people you know it's like take some time and sit with with cannabis in a different way than just you know being social and going outside yourself it's when you come I'm inside yourself that something really changes right yeah. it, I, it makes sense though if we consider um one uh two things first that can one cannabis i think is psychedelic uh by the definition that humphrey osmond had when he coined the word it is psychedelic um, the second thing is that cannabis is the only psychedelic that we use in micro doses for macro effects. Mm. Because when we're smoking joints, that is, and Duchess knows, and everybody here knows, that cannabis you're getting out of a joint is a micro dose of what you could get from a brick of hash. So it's the one, it's the one psychedelic. And again, I do think it is psychedelic, at least according to what Humphrey Osmond had in mind when he coined the word. And it's the only psychedelic that we microdose for macrodose effects. And for that reason, that's why I think people can have these expansive experiences with it and be like, whoa, but it was just cannabis. Oh, it's still a psychedelic. Mm -hmm. Right. What do you guys think, um, you know, I think this could be a question for you, Tom and Eden, uh, and also for you, Duchess. Um, um, Tom, you, you, you will be aware of the um, uh, uh, British government's India Hemp Drugs Report of 1893-94. Right? Oh, of course. Yes, of course you would. Yes. Um, <laughs> men, most people aren't, but it's an no. amazing report. I haven't read the report. But no, I've, I haven't either. I've I was kidding. Read, <laughs> um, I've read some of the uh, parts of the appendix by J.M. Campbell, um, who was, his part of it was, uh, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, by the way, this was a, an immense project uh, where the British government, uh, who were um, in charge of India, so to speak, at that time, uh, uh, decided they wanted to know what was going on with uh, with that plant in India. And uh, basically, the, the shortest version is they found out absolutely no problem, no social harm, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. J.M. Campbell's bit was the spiritual use. And he has some amazing quotes in there about it. Um, this is leading to a question, by the way, <laughs> um, which was things like people reporting saying, you leave behind the murky thickness of matter and con you know con convene with the divine, you know, all these kinds of things, beautiful comments about the uh, truly uh, awakening power of cannabis. The question is, um, these were people taking it orally, I'm pretty sure, for the most part, that they're referring to. They're drinking these bong lassies and things like yeah. that. So how do you guys feel about the difference between oral ingestion and inhaled cannabis that way? For me, oral cannabis has always affected me in a way stronger way. But that's, I can't speak for everybody, but for me, that has always been the case. Again, when, when you take it orally, you're getting the macro dose. When you smoke it, you're getting the micro dose, in my opinion. The way that your um, body processes it, it going through the liver and, you know, it becomes a totally different molecule. It becomes 11 hydroxy as opposed to del delta nine. And um, you're, I mean, I only started eating uh, cannabis, cannabis that is uh, activated, because I've eaten raw cannabis for a while, but cannabis that's activated, I only really started eating in the last two years because edibles really, really hit me. And the the experience is even more, um, I find, heady than what I know to expect when I smoke a joint 
a flower or flower and hash. Edibles, you just go over one little step and suddenly everything's a little swirly. Everything's a little bit like what your classic psychedelics are. And if you're not ready for that, it can be too much. Mm -hmm. There's certainly lots of problems and stories about that. You know, the classic one of the people that eat a brownie and 45 minutes later, they look at each other and go, are, are you feeling anything? I'm not. Let's have another one. <laughs> and then the first one kicks in another uh -huh. half hour later, and the second one kicks in, and at five in the morning, you're staring at the ceiling watching gargoyles going, let me off, let me off. <laughs> well, and, and that's why it's always, you know, that number one rule of dosage is low and slow, mm -hmm. right? You know, it's yeah. and, and edibles, I think it's, I'm glad you guys are bringing that up because people get, um maybe not misled but they don't know because of the timing and then it also tastes good you know right yeah. and you don't yeah. know your dosage even mm -hmm. if i buy an edible out there and it's it's all got its doses i never really know for sure right so it's low and slow I, i'm the same way so my question is <clears throat> You know, it, it's a great time in history, I think, in many ways to have the legalization of cannabis. You know, we've got it in Canada and a number of states and a number of uh, parts around the world. Um, and there are pros and cons that I know, you know, we've seen it. But I've recently in the past week heard a lot about the um, the trade, specifically in the U.S. and California, where crops are going to fallow, you know, there's farmers kind of getting outside of the, the legal side, and things are almost reverting back to, you know, the, um, you know, the underground side of cannabis versus the legal, where the legal's not making anything. So what do you think is happening down there? And what do you suggest or think the future should be when it comes down to, you know, this legalization aspect of, of cannabis? Uh, well, I mean, is a that... couple of things are happening. I will say a couple of things are happening. It's not one thing, but a couple of things are happening. Um, and it does come down to greed, though. So what has happened is that in, um, when California went legal, the the policy up until the last minute, like literally the 11th hour, was that mom and pops were going to be allowed five years to be established before these MSOs, which are multi-state operators, big Walmart type of situations would be able to come in. At the last moment, that was changed. So mm. right off the beginning, a whole bunch of mom and pops could not compete because the, the cannabis game became a numbers game of how big you can you grow how much can you monocrop the situation so that you know you only have one thing to deal with, which is terrible once you get a problem and the whole thing is a problem. Um, and they really didn't understand the market. So a lot of what was seen was the green of the dollar sign. So we're talking about pesticides, we're talking about poor quality cannabis, and a lot of it, like a lot, a lot, a lot of it. So at a certain point, no matter how much money has been pumped into the marketing of a MedMan or a um, what's this purely for any of these companies that have turned tail and run? They didn't have the quality, they didn't have the integrity, they didn't have the quality, and they didn't have the culture which had been there forever, showing them how to actually grow cannabis in a way that's going to be respectful to the cannabis and respectful to the patients. And it just fell off. Then there was also mm -hmm. taxes. I'm sorry, California was taxing everyone left, right, and center. So that's mm -hmm. that's super, super problematic. And mm -hmm. um, taxes and 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 big, big far not even big farmer, but big cannabis coming in was a big issue. And and a lot of people realize that you go back to the legacy market, you are now more in a meritocracy. You're more in a meritocracy in the leg that legacy market than in this legal market where whoever has the money to pay for shelf space is who gets to have shelf space. Yeah, that's that probably, sucks. You know, mom and pop can't handle that. So that's yeah. what happens. That's uh, to I, I agree totally with you, Duchess. And to follow up on the question, I mean, one of the reasons, Mark, I believe that it's starting to revert back to the underground is well, first my farmer is open past 10 p.m. So <laughs> my farmer is not regulated by the government. Mm -hmm. My farmer's stuff is better than anything I've ever bought in a store. And yeah. I want to support my friend anyway, you know. Um, I think for 
those reasons, it, it, you know, as long as well as what Duchess is saying on the, um, you know, on the business end of it, I agree totally. I'm just trying to add some of like the personal, you know, again, from the macro to the micro, yeah. you know, that's that, why that's I still, yeah, yeah, it's like, because for a lot of us, I mean, we've all been, it's not like these stores, these dispensaries opened and the five of us were saying, oh, good, I can finally get cannabis. <laughs> <laughs> no, we were already, we had plenty of it. <laughs> I, you know? I actually, but. In, in, here in BC, I actually buy more from uh, you know a, a grower that uh, that I work yeah. with that that is not part of the legal uh, exactly. framework. But exactly, um, just and to, I make my own potions and stuff because I'm a little witch. So it's like I, I make my confections, <laughs> you know, yeah. and it's like I don't I don't really need the shops. I mean, in a pinch, I'll go to a store because it's like oh, like we're on our way to this place or whatever, and it's like oh, there's a I mean, it's Portland, there's a dispensary every ten feet. So it's like, you know, I'll get it in an emergency. But other than that, farm is still better, I think. Yeah. You and know, they put the so love into it, too. And like when Doug, if I could say one last thing, um, reading Duchess's article uh, for your book, How Psychedelics Can Help Save the World, that I read to endorse it. It's like you read how much she loves and respects this plant mm -hmm. in that piece. It's not a question <clears throat> When you read it, whereas if I go to a store, I don't know that that person put the same amount of love, attention, and respect into this plant, which for me is a spiritual ally. Beautiful. Yeah. yeah. I, you know what? I was going to ask that question, so I'm really glad you addressed it. Um, you know, what? What? what is that effect? But I, I want to add a couple more quick points about the um, problem with California, because um, uh, oh, I got a newsletter from Project CBD the other day. And they they said that the the two main reasons that they've identified is um, uh, when Prop 64 came in, uh, improving that legal cannabis, uh, it was supposed to make you know a key element of that was making it affordable for people. Um, and now the the taxes they're applied at all these different levels. And in the article by Project CBD, they said the tax on cannabis when it's all totaled and it's cumulative too, like you're taxing the taxes is approximately a hundred times the tax that's applied to wine, a hundred times. It's ridiculous. And the other thing that they, they pointed out is that um, they think was a big mistake was allowing individual communities to decide whether to allow it or not. And a lot of communities apparently didn't, which opened the market for the um, underground people to come in. Yeah. Well, yeah, well, we, we felt that in um in Denver, we were just at, uh, Eden and I were at the MAPS conference, and I went to a dispensary to get a joint, and the young lady rings me, a very nice young lady, and she says, $28, and I was like, no, no, no just one joint, yeah, $28, and I was like, just out of principle alone, I couldn't, I'm not spending $28, but it was like, yeah, well, there's the sales tax, there's the tax on top of the sales tax, there's the you walked into our store tax, you're breathing air, we got to tax you on that. It's like, that's what it was like. And it's like, at the end of, you know, this laundry list, it's a $28 joint. <laughs> and it's and like, Canadian I can go walk dollars. around the block and get a bag for $10 and rolling papers for a dollar. Like, what are we doing yeah. here? That's like $40 in Canadian money for a joint. Yeah. That's yeah, just joint. absurd. Maybe yeah, it's ridiculous, right? yeah. But, you were going to say think, something, uh, Duchess, about that also? Yeah. Oh, I mean, I was just thinking about how crazy that is, which, of course, I'm always an advocate of grow your own. <laughs> grow your own, make your own, grow your own. Because uh, over here, over, over here on the legal market in New York, they're also killing them with taxes, not as bad as, as California, but the average eighth in California costs you like $80 for an eighth. Wow. That's, mm -hmm. that's not good. That's eighty dollars for an eighth. Yes, which, with which is another Jesus. another great reason to support your local farmer. But this is uh, we did a, uh -huh. an event when cannabis first became legal in Canada. We did a little event called Cannabis One Hundred One to educate people because there's more people now curious because it's legal and what they need to know. And uh, Gerald Thomas spoke there, I believe, is where where he's he had mentioned it. But he was just encouraging people because in Canada you can grow four plants. He was saying one of the best things you can do is grow your four plants. And even if you don't smoke it, right? You know somebody who does. If you love gardening and have a green thumb, 
grow your four plants because you're also, you know, growing medicine for someone who may need it if they're using for chemotherapy or whatever it may be. There, this brilliant and simple way to, you know, um, offset the. Mm-hmm you know, that legal market. And we, we see it here and we hear it here in Canada, in Canada all the time. In cannabis. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> in cannabis, <laughs> our um, home and native plant. plant. <laughs> but it's true, but it's just, it's the way that big business was never interested in cannabis in, until it became legal. And all the mom and pops, all the people who fought for legalization, who put their, you know, their credibility on the line, their, criminal records on the law, everything on the, you know, all of a sudden they get forgotten. Right. And they're the pioneers who did all did the work to get us to that point of legalization. And then once it happens, all of a sudden they're shunned and pushed out and they've got, you know, the better, bud. it's, it's just, it's not attached to the energy of that commercial corporatization and profit. Right. Yeah. You know, in fairness right. to um, the the Canadian system here in British Columbia, anyway, certainly in the Vancouver area, they have been listening and they've been changing things. And they've the, there are lots of mom and pop uh, retailers, of course, but there are also more and more craft growers coming in. They're finding ways to bring in the craft growers. So you can actually find some decent weed uh, in, in the shops in Vancouver these days and, um, you know, organically grown, sun grown things like that there are small operations scattered around the province so they're bringing these people in more so thank thank god for that um uh yeah they are it's 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 improving here and the prices aren't that bad i'm not sure what an eighth is but it's maybe a third of what five grand pardon no oh i mean in price uh well i'll tell i'll uh, tell you i i went to a local dispensary here in hope because as i've moved out of the you know it's a convenience factor only but when we go in we see our local farmer i i paid about 28 to 31 dollars depending on which strain canadian for an eighth that's what i was thinking yeah honestly it's been you know you could pay 35 40 depending on the strain or or what have you yeah um and it's actually pretty nice stuff and i've also had some really bad stuff that just turns into powder when you open it what i hate the most about it honestly is the packaging in these places you know you get a plastic jar in a cardboard box that's way bigger than the little bit of butt i just bought Right. So if we think environment, if we think all of those, what happens is you see the commercialization of how it happens for the marketing, the boxes and everything where, you know, you go to your farmer and you could just get it in a nice little bag. It's more environmentally friendly and you can see it. You can touch it. You can smell it. Uh, Tom won't even let his farmer put it in a plastic bag, paper paper only. (laughs) Well, yeah, no, all, well, hold on a second. All entheogens should never, ever be put in plastic bags ever. Mm. Did, would you, these, these, the these are are um these are mushrooms and plants with spirits you all have a spirit would you want somebody putting a plastic bag over your head no of course not. <laughs> no 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 it's true it's true I like, understand. And, it's and, a good... and, and mark i'm with you 100 i went to a dispensary once to get gummies and the gummies are in their own individual wrap plastics which is in its own plastic which was then put in a plastic bag and i'm like I don't need a bag. And like, no, we have to give you one. It's like, so you are literally being forced to create waste. Yeah. I would say one thing that was good was that in Portland, when cannabis first became legalized, that was, we all made a stink about that. And they very quickly started recycling. Like if you go into a dispensary now in Portland, they have bins for you to bring your plastics and like the, the cannabis tubes and these things and what have you. And so they do recycle them now, but it's interesting that that wasn't part of the original plan. Dare I say, if anybody on this call would have been in charge of the packaging of cannabis, there'd be a lot less of it. And there would have been a recycling program already put in place before it was even rolled out. The issue that I'm having is that the people with not perhaps, or people with misguided intentions are the ones in the driver's seat. 
Um, and that's, you know, again, and not to endorse your book again or kiss your ass, but that was one of the things <laughs> I really liked about your book, Stephen, was that every single contributor, and I read it cover to cover, every single contributor, like you could tell that they were into this and serious about it and mm. wanting to what's best, not only for the plants and mushrooms, but for the people using them. Yeah, well, it's kind of a, you know, prosaic uh, in a concern in a way this packaging issue but i would say it's part of the of the transformation process because it's 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 a universal um societal problem i mean with packaging for yeah. damn near everything right yeah. yeah um i also wanted to make a comment and perhaps a question for you folks as well about something mark said a, a moment ago about um uh you know this idea of growing plants and sharing it and i think this is really important because um, what we're ideally trying to do, I think, or hoping to do, or our vision is that that um, we get away from the sort of individualizing capitalistic system and sharing things. And a joint, for, for example, um, symbolizes that, you know, the sharing of a joint or the sharing of cannabis medicine. And I think that's perhaps one of the reasons why it has this potential to be the sort of sacrament of peace of the future. You know, the, I mean, it, that's kind of the background of the 60s and 70s folks, the hippies and whatnot is, you know, you, know, you didn't, you didn't, you know, go into a room with a, you know, a, a couple of joints um, and say, well, hey, I'd like everyone to chip in five bucks for this joint, you know, you just pass the joint around. <laughs> yeah. yeah, like we do it every Monday at our open mic. It's just people start smoking joints and just pass them. That's it. Uh, Duchess, why did you say... Um, we did a little um, five minute uh, interview uh, mm -hmm. a couple of weeks ago. Um, uh, looking forward to the, what you put together on that. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah but um, you said something about. Um, oh, God, now I forgot. I got distracted by that one. Never mind. Move on, folks. <laughs> Okay, well, well I, just, I mean, yeah, let, me, let me just throw something in here that, like, uh, in a reference, something we talked about before. Oh, pardon uh, me, social. You said it was good for cannabis is best used as a social thing. Could you explain what that means? Oh, yes. I was, oh, okay. Again, you can uh, go home to your own house and smoke cannabis by yourself and really, really get into your own head. Um, And there's value to that. But um, I feel like cannabis is always, um, encouraging us to remember that we're part of the human fabric uh, all together and we're, we, need, we need each other. And so what I was going to start off talking about uh, was about the value that Mark was um, saying that he was gaining from your, your ritual where it's just a little bit and then it's so just a little bit was smoked and then such an amazing thing happens. I think that has to do with the fact that you're cannabis ritual is not just one person like you know when we did SPMC in um, 19 the entire the whole conference when we were all breathing together and if you think about all uh, those Belgian horses that like are super super strong and can pull a certain amount like by themselves like this I don't remember what their horsepower is I think something like 15 or 20 individually but together they don't pull two times what they can pull they pull like oh, two, like and, two a half, and a half three times what they can pull right so within cannabis when we're doing it together when we are of, of this of the same accord the, even small amounts of cannabis can rise us to levels that are incomparable you know that we, we're not going to really achieve by ourselves it's like we are sharing breath like when i smoke chillum chillum is different from the joint because it's this intentional sharing of breath and sharing of intention of being in the circle, not thinking about whatever or on your phone, but just being in the circle and somehow the magic that is created in the conscious inhaling, exhaling and passing and knowing that you're sharing with each other, the, the magic and the experiences of that cannabis. It's, it's, there's nothing like it. There's, there's, there's nothing like it. Cannabis is magic. Spread the spirit well. Well, and, and I think what, what you said, that just about, you know, bringing that conscious intent to, mm -hmm. you know, our use of 
you know these plants and and conscious it might just for some people be having having fun on the weekend and connecting with people because it's a very social thing but there's a conscious intention versus just you know dope is for dopes you know that saying or or anything like that when we bring a level of consciousness to it like with anything it changes its impact and and that's what i've learned in, in my uh understanding reverence and respect for you know santa maria the sacrament the plant teacher you know even tobacco i is something i learned um over the years in this um in this work that i've kind of was led into um by the plants and as Stephen and i would say who follow the golden thread um but it's just to see how that all connects and uh brings people closer together in, in, in an even more beautiful way and i i totally agree you know when you have people magnifying you know relationships and more people participate magnify that experience with their intention with their consciousness that help us all rise to a completely uh different level mm -hmm. there's a synergy there and i'm I'm thank you for bringing that up because mm -hmm. you know we're, you're gonna see that i guess for people down in portland who are gonna join uh all of you um in person at at the sanctum psychedelia pay what you can for instance i love it um steven's going to be leading one of his uh I, I would have to say by now world renowned uh, world famous cannabis ceremonies with the p he, he's he's humble about it which you is great but, guy, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's it's um i say that only because you know it certainly changed my life and my perception of what <laughs> cannabis can be and experience is the best teacher so it's one thing for us to all talk about our experience but we can't tell people what a rose smells like if they haven't smelled a rose and i think it's great that steven's bringing his um you know a cannabis ceremony as an experiential component to the conference uh in portland in, in a few weeks so um i just encourage anybody who's watching it's it's a very profound experience if you have a chance to uh sit with cannabis in a spiritual ceremonial way it's it's a game changer not to mention all the other uh great speakers including duchess and uh, yeah. uh, that are going to be there at that conference i'm really excited about it dennis mckenna um one of the people i can do double duty on our promo here is you're having acacia lewis aren't you tom yes yeah well i favorites. found out about her from you and she's now going to be speaking at the spirit plant medicine Con medicine conference uh november 3rd to 5th folks um, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, um, i've watched a couple of uh, of her uh youtube videos and my god you know she leaves terence mckenna in the dust as far as i'm concerned right <laughs> not, not, not on this not on the speculative you know component aspect but on the experiential component you know yeah, but um Mark, you didn't do even I have get time to finish the sentence when you asked me like do you know of any speakers acacia lewis <laughs> that's what our conversation was like oh, anyway yeah, <laughs> yeah. um Mark, do amazing. i have time to ask these guys another question another yeah I, I whatever is good for for tom and and the duchess i i'm happy to uh you know <clears throat> i have no yeah. specific time limit today well i, uh, I, ask... can, I have time for one more <laughs> if, if you have time for one more i got time for one more yeah great cool Good. okay so um uh <clears throat> one of the um i'll prelude into this and then ask the, ask the question one of the contributors to cannabis and spirituality mariano da silva who um, works with ayahuasca ceremonially and um, group format and stuff like that says that um uh, occasionally uh, with people who really know what they're doing, because we're talking powerful stuff here, um, they will, um, after, I think what they do is they'll have um, near the beginning, they'll have a round of the ayahuasca, and then they'll do some meditation and things like that, sing some songs, and then have a second round. And after the second round, but only with you know experienced people, um, they will smoke a little cannabis. And what he says is that the ayahuasca takes you to the top of the mountain, and the cannabis gives you wings to fly in the wind so my question for you folks is what do you think about combining and there are different ways to do it i suppose but combining cannabis with other psychedelics oh i can definitely so i mean i i am a full believer of that in different ratios um and knowing what i'm trying to achieve uh because um cannabis can as you said the word potentiate 
be in mushrooms and such like that. If I am having a if I'm having a trip that is substantial and it's a little bit difficult, it depends on how it is difficult, whether I will introduce canvas. Canvas might just not make it worse, not worse, but make it more stressful for me. But then I have found for some um, trips that cannabis in the beginning makes it a smoother transition from this mm. beauty space to to the next space. You know, um, when I had one of my most difficult trips I've ever had, I didn't have any cannabis. And although I could see the cannabis, I couldn't I couldn't really put myself in that position to like to enjoy it. And I think it was partially because I really needed to get that message. So I, I the mushrooms almost didn't allow me to soften the blow, so to speak. But on a day to day, since I microdose uh, three times a week, and I definitely in, you know in, enjoy and employ cannabis many times uh, a week. Um, it's a it's a it's a working relationship. Um, sometimes if I'm going to be doing a lot of skating, I might microdose. I might already be in the flow, but microdosing just to stay on top of it and notice that if I smoke. Rather than being in the flow in the moment, like Eckhart totally would talk about, the cannabis kind of puts a pause on that. Kind of makes me start thinking about like assessing. And I'm just like, oh my gosh, I was just in the flow. But then I had cannabis maybe perhaps out of habit, wanted to feel a little bit nice. And that wasn't helpful for me. So these days I'm really um really cognizant of when I need to just uh, stay with the microdose for that three to four hours or some cannabis before that and then the microdose but not willy-nilly because you just never know what you're gonna get that way hmm. yeah um I so I most of the time when I am doing deep dives I I tend to keep things separate um it's, I don't know, for me, there's like way too much nuance with different interactions and also with how, where I am at the moment in that moment also makes a big difference. Uh, so it's just one example at SPMC, this past one, I tried Iboga for the first time. And later on that night, I smoked some cannabis and the cannabis and Iboga did not like each other at all. Mm -hmm. But I've also recently got my hands on some more Iboga and I smoke cannabis with it and they're perfectly fine together. So I think that something was just going on with me in that moment that I can't actually attribute to either the cannabis or the Iboga. Uh, likewise, with other things like MDMA, normally cannabis kills my MDMA role. Like if I'm peaking and I'm like, oh, smoke a joint or something, get high and nope, it just neutralizes it. Wow. However, I found out recently that smoking dabs is very different on MDMA, and it is hmm. way better. Um, and that wasn't an alt-right thing. I was doing an okay sign, but just making sure. <laughs> I'll do thumbs up instead. Um, but yeah, that's really good. And as far as cannabis and mushrooms, the only way I could explain it was like this. And this is a weird example, but it's the only analogy I could come up with. Do you know when you have like a chalk outline of like a body on the ground? Mm -hmm. Now imagine somebody came in and made a smaller body inside that body that lined up with, you know, the arms and legs and head and everything. I like, I become that inner person when I smoke and if I take mushrooms and smoke and it feels like my body is the outer outlining and I'm just kind of sinking into myself in a way that isn't always pleasant. So, I mean, with cannabis and other psychedelics, look, we are all our own chemistry lab and sometimes you just have to do a little self-experiment, but low and slow, as Mark would say, to find out mm -hmm. how they're going to interact with you personally. Beautiful. And, and I, I want to add something to that, if I may, because um, no. only my my experience um, as I started learning and starting going down this road of plant medicine and now mushrooms and cannabis, spirituality, healing, I, I do dove into Terrence McKenna's work on YouTube. I say I took the Terrence McKenna YouTube University and <laughs> I remember him talking about um, he likes to do mushrooms in the dark with 
silence and as few people as he could possibly handle. Oh, and yeah. then he, he said, and I had to go back because I had to see if I listened to it correctly, he says, and I'd roll about four or five big bombers. And I'm like, what, what? And I listened to it because what he was saying was that if he starts really tripping and being out there, if he has a couple of tokes, it'll kind of land him back in to his body again in a way um mm. so it's just something i always kept in mind when i'm journeying um mm. and then the other side of that coin is so many different medicine carriers have different um lack of better word rules or ways of which they deliver and i just kind of follow that because some people would never mix aya with anything let alone cannabis or anything like that some people would never do my you know so it's it becomes this thing where tom you said it best is we are our own pharmacy mm -hmm. and biochemically <clears throat> that way so it's yeah. about knowing ourselves and what works for each other but i'll also you know learn from the people who are leading the process and follow their kind of initiatives and, and the way that they like to do things to respect their ceremony as well. Um, but I never forget that time when I was listening to Terrence McKenna talking about, you know, four or five big bombers, because that was his process with the mushroom. So I just wanted to share that. Yeah. I also want to just add in, you know, because you've said that and Tom said that um, about experimenting. And I think that's one of the reasons cannabis has such a great potential for being sort of like the universal sacrament of peace, etc., is because it's safe to experiment with. And it, you know, as again, as I said at the beginning, it's the people's plant, it's our plant, you know, and, um, you know, you can do this, you know, start, start slow and go start low and go slow thing. And then you can find your dosage, you can find your ways of using it you can find your um you know cultivar strain etc 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 um in a way that's um more uh user friendly I, I think in general than other psychedelics probably yeah well said well said well as we wrap up first i want to thank uh duchess for for joining us today i really appreciate you being here as well mm -hmm. tom and eden always a pleasure to connect with you guys and stephen you know, we spend our days chatting regularly, so that's always fantastic. Mm -hmm. But if there was one um, last word as we move into uh, closing up, you know, Duchess, tell people how they can find you, get a hold of you, in where where they might learn more about you and your work, um, and we'll just kind of go around the table to close things up. Sure, I can be found. Uh, my writings that I have done about hashish, cannabis, and uh, psychedelics can be found on my website, thedankduchess.com. And on all um, social media, you can reach out to me, the Dank Duchess. Um, and I, you know, I'm always here to educate and to inform and to connect. So thank you for having me. Ooh, beautiful. Thank you. Tom and Eden. Uh, you can find us on sort of like with Duchess, except uh, just. Uh, substitute the Dank Duchess for Sanctum, P-S-A-N-C-T-U-M on Instagram, Facebook. Uh, our website is uh, sanctum.org. Uh, we are currently archiving the last 34 boxes of the Timothy Leary collection that was still in private hands when he passed. So we have all of that stuff here. And um, yeah, uh, or if you want to get in touch with me directly, if you're interested in the more historical side of these things, same thing like putting the dank duchess into a search engine just put psychedelic historian into any search engine or social media um except for twitter because i don't have one and i should come up because twitter is awful uh, yeah, yeah. and stephen yeah well um first of all <clears throat> excuse me <clears throat> uh that conference that uh, we spoke about um um is july what are the dates again tom july 21st to the 23rd although the speakers begin on the 22nd uh we have a speaker reception uh the night of the 21st okay so that's coming up pretty soon less than three weeks away at this point mm -hmm. um and uh as mark has clearly pointed out non 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 accessible is not acceptable so it's very affordable so um i hope lots of people will come to that um and um 
And then speaking of conferences, uh, uh, the Duchess will be speaking again at the Spirit Plant Medicine Conference, November 3rd to 5th in Vancouver. And we uh, moved from our super early bird phase um, to our early bird uh, stage of ticket prices, which are still very reasonable, lower than a lot of conferences. Um, we're trying to be very, um, what's the word, generous about um, not uh, having too high prices, but also not having to <clears throat> rob banks to get through the next year, um, for example. Um, <laughs> I just uh, rob banks. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah anyway, <laughs> um, so there's that spirit. It, it's all behind Mark on the screen there. If you're viewing this as opposed to listening to this Spirit Plant Medicine Conference, spiritplantmedicine.com. Mark and I are also going to be doing a lot of interviews with our speakers over the next few months. Um, and then, as Mark mentioned at the outset, um, I've got a couple of books. The most recent one is How Psychedelics Can Help Save the World. There are 25 contributors to the book, and uh, the Duchess is one of them, actually. Hey, there's the book. Beautiful. Um, so, um, uh, and that the mission of the book is pretty much stated in that in that title, like how how can psychedelics help us transform this um, struggling planet at the moment? It's a it's a big ask. It's a big job, but you know. Um, any other attitude other than um, you know going for it, so to speak, is not really functional. So I hope people will participate in every way that they can, or any way that they can, actually. Um, yeah, and I'm I'm pretty reachable. Stephen Gray Medicine um, uh, or Stephen Gray Vision dot com for for the website, um, and a few other things that are Stephen Gray Vision will get you to different places like Facebook. I do interviews on YouTube, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Well, thank you so much, Duchess, Tom, Eden, and Stephen, for joining us. If you want to meet all four of these wonderful folks, you can see them again in Portland on uh, July 20th. You said 20th, right? 20th to 23rd? 21st. 21st, 21st to 23rd. 23rd. And uh, I'm sure Tom and Eden will be up at the conference in Vancouver in November as well, because they are always there and we always want them there. We'll and there. Uh, you'll see me around. Mm -hmm. But I just want to thank you for the work you guys do uh, to make, you know, psychedelics, plant medicine accessible, uh, the education behind it, because I think the world needs to, to understand that these aren't drugs, they are medicines. Anytime something's a plant, as far as I'm concerned, they're, plants aren't drugs, plants are plants. And um, I think that, you know, as the world is changing, it needs all of our support in whatever way we can bring a higher consciousness from love, peace, joy, mm -hmm. gratitude, and most of all, let's have fun. Life's meant to be enjoyed, everyone. Let's, mm -hmm. you know, be playful share some nice words with each other and again spread the love spread the cheer that's what the world needs more than anything today so mm -hmm. thank you all for being here can't wait great. to see you cats in portland yo Dodgers, we're gonna yeah, have yeah. a great time looking no, forward already. <laughs> okay cheers, cheers bye now. Bye. peace bye bye <laughs>